This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. Well, that was utter domination, and I think mostly unexpected how easy it looked. Patriots beat the Browns 45-7, to and Greg, the question that people are asking, are the Patriots back? I, I, I want to say yes, Nick, but I... I... I don't want to uh, overpromise and underdeliver with this team. Um, you try, as a journalist, you try not to get caught up into what's going on and and just sort of deal with the facts. I and mean, look, there's no question that whether it was in the press box or reviewing the film, and and I've watched all the offense film. I have not finished the defense yet. Uh, it was as an impressive Patriots performance that I've seen in some time in terms of utter domination wire to wire. I think I would have to go back to the 2019 season opener um, or yeah, 2019 season opener uh, against the, against the Steelers. And, you know, the way they executed in this game in all phases and the way they, they beat you in so many different ways was just really, really impressive. And it reminds you of Patriots teams past now, the thing that I, I, I'll caution, and I'm just, I'm not, I know I'm not going to go overboard. I'm sure the fans are. Uh, I'm not going to go overboard yet because I'm just not sure what this team's ceiling is. Um, there have been years past where we've seen performances like this, maybe like, you know, like 2019, uh, where down the stretch it didn't hold up and they kind of got exposed that they beat up against a soft schedule. Will we look back and say this stretch of games was, really a lot softer than we thought maybe but in just in terms of what I look for in a game I was happy watching this film it's been a long time since I've been happy and (laughs) and the Patriots were just they were great in all all the phases it was very fun to watch they were dominant in the trenches after that first drive on both sides of the football they really dictated this game from beginning to end, again, from the first drive and on. Obviously, the first drive was a disaster. Dearness Johnson ran the football down their throat. Mm -hmm. But after that first drive, man, they dictated this game. And when we look at this in the big picture, I tend to agree with you as far as the ceiling. I'm not really sure what the ceiling is, but I'm also not really sure what the ceiling for the rest of the conference is. This is a very strange season. The, The AFC is as wide open as I could ever remember a conference being this deep into a season. You can almost flip a coin to tell me who's the better team in this conference. I mean, Tennessee, uh, at least record-wise, is the best team in the conference, but their offense the last two weeks has not been good. They've had like 470 total yards the last two weeks combined. They're really led by their defense. I'm interested to see if a team can get through that defense without Derrick Henry. Is Tennessee good enough? Kansas City, they're back and forth. And the rest of the conference is pretty much just stuck in the rest of the muck right there. So I don't know about the ceiling ultimately. I will say that this recent stretch of the four-game win streak, it does make me feel better about the Tampa game and the Dallas game. When we said, oh, well, maybe they're just kind of, you know, maybe this happened during that game. Maybe that happened. I think now you look at that and with context, you say, no, okay, now you feel pretty good. They're 6-4. and four. They played two of the top teams in the NFC tight and could have won both of those games. So I think overall, when you look at this team compared to the rest of the league and especially the AFC, I don't think there's much separation between them and everybody else right now. Will that be the case in a month? I'm not so sure. Looking at this win, Greg, at least I felt different about this win versus – you know, the win against the Jets and some other wins that we've seen recently. Did you feel much different about this win versus others? I did. And, uh, you know, in watching the film back, it became a little bit more clear that the difference in this game and the difference, in my opinion, to the way Mac Jones looked, because um, I don't care what happened on Sunday. I absolutely stand by the fact that Mac Jones had plateaued whatever hit some sort of rookie wall in the previous three games um give the kid credit he pushed through it I mean that's that's really what ultimately happens in a in an NFL rookie's career is the guys who play a lot at some point you're going to be challenged and are you going to push through or are you going to give in and just sort of um you know shrink the rest of your rookie season and then come back for your next year give Mac Jones credit I think he realized what was going on in Josh McDaniels and he pushed through it. But here's the, the clear difference to me in this game, Nick, was 
was the offensive line. And I'm not talking about like them. They they were really good. Certainly Trent Brown made a difference. I will say like Isaiah Wynn did not play well in this game. So it wasn't like the, the, and, and look, David Andrews and Ted Karras sometimes had their struggles. It wasn't complete domination up front, but this is, this was the difference. They protected much better in this game. I mean, both the, in terms of the stats that I keep, the total quarterback pressures, the pressure percentage, the run stuffed allowed, the Patriots hit season low, clear season lows in both in this game. And to me, Mac Jones was comfortable in this game. I think some of it was the Browns. The Browns aren't exactly exotic in what they do. Um, The Patriots took care of the guys that you need to take care of on the Browns defense. And he was he was not rushed all that much. He was hit four times in the game. Yeah, there were some quarters where he was hit four times <laughs> in games this season, and this is part of the reason why early on in the season people are saying this about Mac Jones, and he's not going deep down the field, and he's not doing that. And I never said anything because I saw the stats. Almost every game this year, uh, every game he's been pressured over thirty percent of the time. Most of the games it's been over thirty-five, and for a pocket quarterback. That's normally almost a death sentence for those guys in terms of their effectiveness. In this game, it dropped down to about 22% in terms of pressure. It was night and day. And so you saw Mac Jones finally relax, and I don't have to worry about getting killed on every snap. And then you wonder why he was almost perfect in this game, and that's the reason why. But the back to the offensive line real quick. It wasn't just they played well up front. Trent Brown made a difference. But you also have to tip your cap big time to Josh McDaniels and the way he was spinning the dial between outside run, inside run, screen this, that. Like, the the Browns didn't know which way they were going. They were basically spinning in a top a lot of times. And that made the protection, it made the running game, it made everything look better. So it was equal parts, the offense just being harmonious for the first time this season. I'm going to circle back to Mac. First of all, uh, this is just the most recent example of this guy responding. And mm-hmm. we we see little examples of this, like microcosms of it. But then when you look at the macro level, that was macro. Like he had, you know, over the past couple of weeks, plateaued, as you said. And it's whether or not he's going to respond. And just like he has shown us within a game, like he showed us in the preseason, like he showed us in camp when he had his worst practice day, he came right back and had one of his best, if not the best. He just responds to the challenge. He's got that confidence slash swag, whatever you want to call it. And this was another example of him answering the bell. He tends to respond when he's challenged, which I think is a fantastic characteristic to have as a professional athlete. The other thing I would say is, you know, people tend to look at the score and they say, oh, 45-7 and, you know, the offensive line was great and, you know, Mac didn't have to do too, too much. It was kind of easy for him. Two points. The first point is that drive that began the game for the Patriots offense. Huge kind of have to have it drive that many people are going to overlook. It's 7 nothing. You are close to going three and out. It's a third and long. You make the play. And that drive continues. Mac makes two or three more throws on third down. The Patriots end up scoring. It's 7-7. Baker throws the pick to Duggar. And pretty much from that point, the Patriots, it's a boat race. So Mm -hmm. that first drive was critical. The second thing I would say, you know, aside from changing at the line of scrimmage, Stevenson 16-yard run, the bucket throw to Myers, the seed between two defenders to Kendrick Bourne, great catch by Bourne for the touchdown. The, you know, soft touch touchdown to Henry, the first touchdown of the game. Dan Orlovsky highlighted the second touchdown by Henry where, you know, Matt kind of looks off the linebacker at the hash to get him away from Henry and then zips it in for the touchdown. You had a you had a number uh, in your column after the game. And, you know, I know some people might not care about analytics. And I think I kind of agree with you, Greg. We use it as a baseline. We, we use it as context. Like it, it yeah. helps. It doesn't necessarily drive opinion, but it helps. Mm-hmm. And, and you had one number and that was the completion above expectation, the completion percentage above expectation. And if you look at Max throws in the game, you know, he, he should have completed, should have completed about 62%. And he ended up completing well into 80%. And so that that or it was 66 percent to 82 percent, I think it's just off the top of my head. It was about Mm -hmm. plus 16 percent. So 
the throws that he is supposed to make, he makes. And some of the throws that you wouldn't expect, he made pretty much most of them on Sunday. And that was a change from what we had seen recently. So there's no doubt that there was an up in Max play. And, and I think that goes to the pressure, Nick, yeah, that yep. he felt more comfortable. Like when when you give a po- – especially a pocket passer. Like the guys who are mobile, they can do things. But you give a pocket passer good protection, and he, and, th- and that – that starts to grow, and it took a while for him to get hit. He had the sack where they missed the cuts, and then there was another sack, I think, in the second half, uh, maybe on the opening drive of the third quarter. But you space that out, and those pocket quarterbacks, they get confidence, and they they relax, and they're like, you know what? I'm going to hang in the pocket a little bit more. I'm going to deliver a ball that I normally don't. It gives them confidence, and to me, that was the difference in in Mac and why he sort of slung it a little bit more in this game. All right, let's get to three things to feel good about. Greg, you could start. Uh, yeah, so the offensive line, I mean, look, Trent Brown made a huge difference in this game. Um, it, it wasn't perfect. You know, he he missed a cut that led to a sack and, yeah. and you know, a couple other blocks. But, I mean, I had him for pl- five-plus run blocks in this game, which is a lot. Um, he, you know, he was at times he was completely dominating on that side. Uh we'll have to figure out Isaiah Wynn. I wonder if Isaiah Wynn's performance in this game makes them reconsider the whole Trent Brown thing. I think if you – it nobody knows what they think of Trent Brown at left tackle anymore. It certainly played that when he was here. Everybody wants them to move. They haven't shown one inkling that that's going to happen from training camp to now his return. They had plenty of time to train him up in practices to be ready to play left tackle. Isaiah Wynn has a fifth-year option. Uh, it was very surprising that Micah Winu was the guy to go to the bench when Brown yeah. came back and not Ted yep. Karras or Isaiah Wynn. That was interesting. But I think that uh, this offensive line, the version that we saw on Sunday in terms of their run blocking, pass protection for a young quarterback to give him time, this is what we thought we were going to get when we started the season. It took up a hell of a long time, longer than it should have, for this group to round into form, but it's here and it's spectacular. <laughs> uh, I will say Josh McDaniels, you, you touched on this a, a lot earlier. He had a fantastic game. Uh, you know, he's, he's figuring out things with this offense and what they are. We've been talking about their identity over the past couple of weeks. They're, they're pretty much solidified, you know, up front, as you just mentioned, and, and they have figured out, what works for them. And McDaniels, I think, was in such a groove on Sunday. And you look back, you know, the was it first and 20 or whatever it was when they when they run the the reverse to Bourne. Great play call. You pick up a huge chunk when you're, you know, in a, in a tough situation. Third and 13. I know Cleveland didn't play it well, but the Brandon Bolden screen. Good play call. Perfect timing for that. I just thought there were a lot of different calls. And you mentioned mm-hmm. a lot of stuff that he did. I thought McDaniels was excellent uh, on Sunday. How about the receivers, Greg? And, well, at least the the pass catchers, if you want to include Hunter Henry. Yeah, I just thought that in terms of catching the ball and making tough catches, this was uh, by far the best game for this unit. And it just looks like, you know, from everything that we've talked about and now the pass catchers, it just seems like – Everybody is growing in confidence into what they're doing. Like you could feel it permeate the unit where, you know, they've, they've been plagued by some drops and some, you know, iffy stuff. And I think Mac Jones is not only comfortable, but he's figuring out what he can rely on and which guys to go to. And it seems like almost all of them. I mean, we know Jacoby Myers occasionally has some drops, but he's mostly reliable. Hunter Henry, you know, I thought that out but when Shaq Mason had that holding call, which they probably would have scored a touchdown before halftime to keep it going. Um, It called it back and held them to a field goal. I thought that play, which was a race, was a really good snapshot into how Mac Jones and Hunter Henry are in sync and that Mac was getting a little pressure on that play. And he just, he let it go before Hunter Henry was even out of his break and it was perfect. And, you know, just, they made a lot of tough catches. And and so I think Mac and the, the receivers and the tight ends, they're just, they're growing in confidence with every week, and I thought they caught the ball really well this week. And, and look, that expected per, uh, completion percentage, um, it, the difference, which I just looked, and it was the best in the NFL in Week 10, which it was by far Mac Jones's best part. 
the the receivers have a lot to do with that as well. We should give them credit because yeah. he should have completed 65% of the passes. He ended up completing like 82%. And that's because guys like Kendrick Bourne and Hunter Henry and those guys made some really tough catches that normally when most receivers would be incomplete. Hunter Henry is now a difference maker. Uh, you know, before the season, we were all talking about John U. Smith. He was going to be the pass receiving tight end, the guy who was electric yeah. and all this. And it hasn't quite worked out for John U. I'm not giving up on him. You know, it's, it's still only half a season. We'll see if he comes back from this injury and is better. But Hunter Henry, this Henry Mac Jones combination is now deadly. And it is especially deadly in the red zone. They've got Mojo together. You can just see the chemistry. And I, I think, Greg, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, this is pretty much what we thought about Henry when he signed. Not that he was going to be, you know, unbelievable between the 20s and making athletic yep. plays. But when you get inside the 20, throw the big guy the football, o- allow him to do some things. And man, over the past six weeks, he's got what, seven touchdowns? He has been a difference maker on this offense. No question. And yeah, I, remember, I think we remember we were talking about in training camp where I was like, I don't know how much of a difference he's going to make in between the 20s because. Uh, it, you know, it takes him a little bit to get down the field, but he was going to be a force in the red zone and that, and that's held up. But my third thing that I feel good about related to that is just, is Mac, Mac settled down, you know, for yeah. two games, he got sped up. He, he was settled down. I was a little bit worried. There was a play, I think near the end of the first quarter, it was a third down pass. And I think it went to Kendrick Bourne over the middle. It was a contested catch, good throw, good catch, uh, converted. It was like a third and seven. I think they got like nine yards. And Matt got me a little bit worried because he – I it, it's funny. This is what you see. And sometimes you see out of Brady, too. When Brady gets sped up, these pocket guys, they run into pressure. And he started to run into the line. Like, Mac like, moved up. He had a fine <laughs> yeah. pocket. But for yep. some reason, he was seeing ghosts. And he moved up. But he still completed the pass. But I was just like, oh, boy, I hope he settled down a little bit. And then he, he ended up doing that. But I think Mac is – Max back on track, back to that uh, ascension that we saw before this little th- um, three-game lull, and uh, and that's a great sign. Uh, my final thing is the running backs. I mean, y- you lose Harris for the week. Stevenson doesn't practice all week. You plop yeah. him in the game, and the dude's a beast. And Brandon Bolden has been much better than I expected him to. Uh, J.J. Taylor, not a great day, not a ton of opportunity, uh, not a great day for him, but Ramondre Stevenson, his unexpected speed when he finds that extra gear, his mm-hmm. finish, like this guy finishes runs. If you're going to want to try to tackle him, just get ready because the train's coming on through. I mean, he yep. he is such a strong, impactful, powerful runner. With that speed, he can catch the football. He's got some wiggle. I mean, you're sitting there watching this game on Sunday and you're thinking to yourself, Mac Jones, Christian Barmore, Ramondre Stevenson not too shabby and you know maybe ronnie perkins whenever he gets healthy if he gets healthy can also flash but stevenson was tremendous on sunday and you know i just think as long as as long as things go well for him with the team and i know you've said that there were maybe some things about whether or not he was you know totally focused and all that stuff and he Mm -hmm. he had he had to lose some weight and trim down a little bit but he was fantastic on Sunday. And if you can keep rolling, if Harris comes back and you've got that two-headed monster of Harris and Stevenson with this offensive line rounding into form with Mac, if he's protected the way he can play, this offensive ceiling is probably higher than I thought it was. Uh, let's get to three things that, that might concern you. Let's start with the defense and your belief in it. Yeah, I just – I'm not sure what to, what to believe um... – how good they are. I think I'm a little bit scarred from 2019, Nick, uh, yeah. to be honest. A lot of these same cast of characters, a lot of the same coaches. I mean, I, I will say, if Bill continues to take over the defense, then I feel a lot better. Um, is that what's happening? It, 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 clearly, clearly. You watch during the games. He is so invested in the defense. He was on the sideline. I tried to get um, my guy, the photographer, uh, Adam Reschens, to uh, – to take a photo, but it was a little bit too late, but Bill was on the whiteboard. This is in like the middle of the second quarter. He was on the whiteboard in front of the defense diagramming stuff up. And we haven't seen that in a couple of years. Not that he doesn't do it. He does do it, but Bill's clearly invested in the defense. He's not making calls. He leaves it up to Steve, but he is the one making, they made clearly made adjustments after the first drive. And that to me, that's all bill. 
I'm, yeah. It ain't Steve. It ain't Gerard. It's Bill. And Bill's doing it, and he's take, taking care of crap on the defense. Um, so I feel better about that if Bill stays. That level of involvement stays. I do think he takes the foot off the gas a bit during the game if they have a bit of a lead and he kind of lets it go. Um, you know, but he's heavily involved in the defense. I just don't – I this stretch, I don't know what to make of these offenses. And I'm not, I'm not comparing anybody else to – the rest of the league or whatever. I, I don't I don't know. I don't watch the rest of the league. I don't see Jack for games. And trust me, this year between between COVID, one less preseason game, the 17 game schedule, to me, this this league is so topsy turvy this year. I'm not even looking at standings until like December in terms of what's <laughs> going on and who's playing well. I you know, last three or four weeks of the season, then I might care. Uh but you know, I, I just think there's a chance, and I'm not saying it's the case. This could be a little bit fool's gold like we saw in 2019 where, uh, you know, these these offenses that they're quote-unquote shutting down are really not that good. I was I was highly disappointed in the Browns and Kevin Stefanski. On, they just got completely outcoached in every phase of the game. They were totally outclassed. And I want to see what the – look, we know – it's the Bills. The season is going to come down to the Bills. The Bills swept you last year. They went to the AFC Championship game. They're still in first place at the moment. They've basically gone wire to wire for two seasons now in first place. You know, there's the referendum. December 6th in in, in Buffalo, we'll get an idea exactly how good this defense is. They certainly execute very well. I, I You know, and, and, and I'll just go through the rest of them because they're related. What happens when a team – and I don't even know if it'll be Buffalo because this isn't their style. What happens when a team decides to shut down Matthew Judon? What happens when a team decides to h- shut down Hunter Henry in the red zone that they that they basically pull a Patriot? You know, how how successful are the Patriots going to be? Can they go to their left? They, they might be able to. These are just things during a four-game winning streak that I'm thinking of and, and being leery of. And also Isaiah Wynn. We touched on it. Um I don't know what his deal is. I don't know what his future is here. He's got to play better. If the rest of the line is picking up the slack, I thought Ted Karras did a really nice job on Sunday. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if they think about the Trent Brown thing, but he's just – he's been one of the weakest parts in this offensive line, and um, that has to be apparent to them. The win stuff is interesting. He's pretty polarizing. There is a contingent of people on Twitter that break down the game. I think Evan Lazar is one of them. Uh, Matt Chatham is another I've seen other people (laughs) over the past and I know how you feel about Chatham but I've seen uh, over the past couple of weeks you know people saying Wynn's playing a lot better Wynn helped shut down Miles Garrett on Sunday so it's kind of interesting that you don't see it quite the same way you still think he's mostly struggling so you know we'll we'll say this let me just as backup I have Wynn for giving up uh, about 65 percent of this pressure in the game four and a half pressures out of their seven that they gave up total uh came from Isaiah Wynn so just to give a little context yeah so he's polarizing we'll see what they do with him uh as far as the defense the question I wanted to ask you we didn't get to this over the last week or two but they're playing a lot more zone coverage and you know they're not going heavy man like they have in the past do you like that is that sustainable in 2021 because I know at the Great beginning question. of the year at the beginning of the year the thought was a lot more defenses are going to go with man coverage what teams are doing with you know with their offense the Patriots are kind of zigging when people are zagging is that sustainable Greg no no quite frankly and I think it, I think it's further evidence on why this might be fool's gold uh, in terms of these these passers I mean it works when you get pressure and they've gotten really good uh, pressure at times in, in these, um, you know, past few games. I think that if Bill Belichick had his druthers, he would play man to man, especially in big spots. He would play two man or double somebody. And, and, but I just, them playing zone, I don't think it's any type of, uh, I don't think it was any type of switch to, of genius for Bill Belichick. I think it was out of necessity that he looked yeah. at, you know, losing Stefan Gilmore and Jonathan Jones who are two of the best man players at their positions on defense, losing them. He looked at it and he's like, we can't play man. Jalen Mills can't run and play man all yeah. game. And, and, yeah. and you know, Jawan Williams and, you know, Miles Bryant and things like that. So, 
that's the, it'll be the whole buff the, the Buffalo game. We're going to see exactly where they are on defense, and who knows? They might beat them. You know how I feel about Josh Allen, <laughs> um, and they they could very well beat them. I have confidence in them, but they're going to have to do things on defense to win that game for sixty minutes, not a quarter and a half or two quarters like it's been that way for the last uh, you know four games. That's that is going to be the referendum. And look, Tennessee's going to stress them too, but I think that's more their speed. All right, lightning round. Three up, three down. Let's start with your three up. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, it's all good. I, uh, Ramondre Stevenson. Um, you know, what? I echo your comments uh, from before. He looks like a franchise back. Uh, speed, power, vision. Helps out a little bit in the past game. Uh, does it all. Looks tremendous. Uh, I can't wait till you know Damian Harris. They have a little thunder and lightning thing going there. Uh, I thought that I thought that Kendrick Bourne was outstanding in this game, and some of it was by design and set up with Josh McDaniels doing the reverses and mixing in the screens and this and that. Uh, but he just made big play after big play in this game, and you know, and also Mac Jones. Um, I thought Mac Jones was excellent in this game. I only had him for two-ish really sort of like one and a half decisions that I didn't love in this game on the deep throw to uh, Nelson Aguilar and there was another one in there oh when he threw a Brandon Bolden or no Stevenson in the flat for like no gain there were some plays to be made down the field but those were really the only two plays that I had any issues with and I had them for uh seven outstanding plays in this game all right how about your three down uh Isaiah Wynn um well no let me go J.J. Taylor first um, just because, you know, he played fewer snaps and you know, he just, it, it's not his fault. I mean, the blocking wasn't there at times when he was running the ball and trying to make plays, but he just wasn't effective. Everybody else was in the backfield and, and he wasn't, and there was a run where he had a chance to make a cut and make a bigger play. And he didn't, he ran right into the line. Uh, Isaiah Wynn, uh, I think is just, he's, he's struggling overall. Um, yeah, he's held his own at times against some of these guys. Uh, he gets a lot of help, including uh, this. This is an example, Nick, of why I watched the film and I'm like, what the hell with the Cleveland Browns? As a, And I learned this being behind the scenes with the Houston Texans. And I hear about, oh, well, this team's going to crack you. All right. You know, you see a guy in short motion. It's alert crack and be ready for the crack block. Miles Garrett, how long has he been in the league? How long has he been a, t- a talented defensive end? And he doesn't like... Before he rushes, he doesn't look around to his right to be like, is anybody in motion? Anybody coming to crack me here like Nikhil Harry and Hunter Henry did in this game? Like, what a moron. Like, what are you yeah. doing? Like, you got to be alert for that. How many times are they going to hit you and you don't know what's coming before you do something different? And so, you know, uh, you know, Wynn did a fine job, and you might be able to pull out stats to say Miles Garrett didn't have much of an effect in this game. That's the scheme more than win and and win certainly gave up basically the whole he gave up uh the amount that the rest of the line did in terms of anything pass blocking run blocking in this game so um i thought he struggled in this game did miles, I need one garrett, more? miles garrett came out while well, you look for another one miles garrett came out in the post game and said well we didn't make any adjustments on the sidelines during the games so. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure uh, the coaching staff and Joe Woods was thrilled about that comment as as he threw the coaching staff under the bus, and he's getting leveled by Nikhil Harry, who, by the way, did a fantastic job blocking all day long. I know he's not making the catches and you know having spectacular production as a first round wide receiver, but that dude the last couple of weeks, especially this past week, uh, doing the job as far as blocking and, and some of the little things that help this run game. And I for the last one, this, this is nitpicking. Those are uh, really – oh, well, Jacoby Myers, the punt returner, for not oh, God. fielding yeah. some of those punts. Yeah. That was Field just – yeah. yeah. <laughs> by the way, just a little fun fact, and I thought he was good in this game. I haven't watched the defensive film yet, the, all of it, but uh, on first blush I thought he was good. But PFF hated Juwan Bentley in this game, hated him. Thought he was basically like one of the worst players in the league, and wow. that was that looked strange to me. I'll see if the all twenty two backs that up. 
Yeah, Meyer is killing me on the punts. Like, let's put Greg Bedard back there. If you're just going to stand there and let the ball hit the field and just, you know, tell everybody, get away, get away. I feel like you and I can do that. Everybody get away. Yep. Get away. Let's lose Peter, more Peter. yardage. I mean, come on now. Mm-hmm. Uh, some quick Falcons talk here as we get ready for Thursday night. Uh, just some defensive statistics and offensive stats. I went through some things earlier today. Uh, defensively, this team's not very good, as you can imagine, just looking at some of the final scores. They got absolutely obliterated by Dallas on Sunday, which might concern you a little bit. You know, if, if they are a team with pride, that might make them respond right after being embarrassed by the Cowboys. But they're awful on third down. They're literally one of the worst defenses in the red zone. They're not terrible against the run, but that might be because, you know, teams aren't too afraid of them to throw against. Because here's a huge number to me, Greg, looking at it. Mm. The Falcons, they are dead last in the NFL in pressure rate. They cannot get... That's been years that they've been that way. By the way, way, fun fact, just a little aside, there was one time where... um, this was this was like five or six years ago, and and I forget where we were. Probably the owners' me- meetings, and and I'm hanging out with uh, Thomas Dimitrov, the former GM who used to be here. Yep. And we we're talking about sort of the moves that they made, and I was just like, I was like, where are you going to get any pass rush? Like, you know, and I, and and he just kind of looked at me like, kind of, he's like, we we have plenty of pass rush. It's now been like five or six years. <laughs> An organization has like no pass rush. Thirty second in pressure rate. So the way the Patriots' offensive line played on Sunday, the fact that Atlanta cannot get to the quarterback makes you feel like Mac might have a pretty comfortable night. Yep. In the office. Uh, so that's defensively. Offensively, if you're wondering, they can't run the football. They're one of the worst <laughs> run offenses in football. So. This is mostly one-dimensional, so I would not be afraid of Mike Davis in the run game. Calvin Ridley is out. He's tending to his mental health. I hope he does well and you know figures some things out and, and gets the help that he needs. It hurts this offense, no doubt. He's an explosive player. He can you know take the top off the defense, quote unquote. So no Calvin Ridley. Uh, Cordero Patterson is hurt. He has yep. been he's been their best, most consistent offensive player from the beginning mm-hmm. of the season. So really, I mean. It, when you're getting ready for Thursday night, the defense is not going to get to Mac Jones by what we've seen. They're, they're terrible on third down. And if the Patriots get in the red zone after a, what, five for six day on Sunday, they have a great chance of putting seven or at least six on the board. Maybe we don't want to take folk for granted, but he's been so good. And then, you know, offensively it's Kyle Pitts or bust. I mean, they've got to hope that Matt Ryan plays out of his mind and Pitts is great. And Greg, I don't know about you, We've learned this about Belichick, and he still does it to this day. Usually when you have one guy, especially if you're one-dimensional, he will find a way to take that dude out of the game. So I've got to imagine that when Belichick is in the in the film room and he's, he's talking to these guys in meetings, defensively, it's Kyle Pitts, Kyle Pitts, and then some more Kyle Pitts. Yeah, I agree. And I think your assessment from what I know about the Falcons um, is, is right on. Um you know, they they don't block very well up front. It's too bad. I like Mike Davis as a running back. I like the yeah. way he runs. Um, yeah, Patterson being out, would do, he's probably not going to be able to play in this game, is a huge blow for them because it at least gives them other options and they use them in different ways, sort of like the Patriots did, um, you know, a, some time ago. Yep. Uh, and defensively, you know, they don't – they just don't have much. They're in like a total rebuild. I, I do like the kid, and he was on my list for – uh, you know, ask for the moon at the trade deadline. AJ Terrell, one of the cornerbacks on the Falcons, yeah, um, stud first rounder. He's going to get paid in the off season. I think he's in a contract year. Um, complete stud, uh, and a guy that if I was the Patriots and I had any pocket change, uh, I would look at you know adding in the off season, depending on what happens with JC Jackson. But uh, yeah, I mean the Patriots should take care of business in this game. Like you said, everything is right up their alley in this game, and. Uh, they should, they should roll on, and then it then it gets into the teeth of the schedule, and uh, we're headed for some fun. We are. Let's get to the uh, BostonSportsJournal.com member question of the day: thirty nine ninety nine on their annual plan, top notch analysis of all the Boston pro sports, and of course, as a Patriot junkie, you also get a ton of video analysis that Greg does on the coaches' film and direct access to him in weekly chats. Again, it's BostonSportsJournal.com. Thirty nine ninety nine on the annual plan, Greg. Uh, what's your question of the day? Okay, so from K, K Demps twenty three, 
He says, um, there's a statement and then sort of a question. Guessing you'd take Mac Jones over Josh Allen based on what you've seen so far, not to mention Mayfield. That's sort of a uh, poke yeah. on a failure of Maz thing that we had last week. In fact, is there any other QB you would have picked for the Patriots over Mac in the last two to three draft classes, given what we know now? Uh, this just, it, it, I don't know if I'm going to directly address the question, but just like, I think it's, it's unfair. So the comment that I made on Felger and Mass, which a lot of people, or at least the mouth breathers on Twitter, have taken out of context, um, was basically like if if they were both available at the same time, basically both if both Baker Mayfield and Mac Jones were coming out in the same draft, right? Who would you want? And I said Baker Mayfield, and the Patriots would. It's in inter- and and that's a, because of physical play and also what you have to keep in mind again this isn't baker mayfield now after three different offensive coaching regimes in cleveland this is both of them as neophytes coming into the league and being trained by josh mcdaniels and bill belichick from incubation okay and i think that's that's germane to all of these discussions like if they were to redraft this year's draft and i'm the patriots and i have the first pick in the draft I'm taking either Trevor Trevor Lawrence or Zach Wilson. I just am. They have a higher ceiling, arm strength wise, mobility, all that stuff. They're the total package. Now, is Mac damn good? And did I like him for the Patriots? Yeah, because I knew they didn't have one of the top picks, and they were never going to have one of those. So those guys were gone. But a lot of the most talented quarterbacks, the whole thing, it, it, the whole part of this discussion, and, and what I reference is. The nature versus nurture thing about the quarterback position. It's the same thing as Aaron Rodgers. If Aaron Rodgers went where Alex Smith did to the 49ers and got the crap pounded out of him, he would have been basically in oblivion for a while and had to resuscitate his career. Instead, he went to Green Bay and got to sit for three years and was almost ready by the time he took the job. He would not have been the same player drafted with the 49ers that he was with the stability of the Packers and Mike McCarthy. And it's the same thing with these quarterbacks. Like, you can't – Mac's doing a great job. The, they're, they're training him up right. He's going to be great in the system, just like we all thought he was going to be, at least, you know, those of us who have been listening here for a while. But there is a ceiling on his physical talent, and it might not matter at the end of the day. He might get better. I think he will in terms of arm strength and things like that. But if – don't don't kid yourself. If this year's draft – if the Patriots had the first pick in this year's draft, they would have taken Trevor Lawrence or Zach Wilson, and they wouldn't have taken Mac Jones. But Mac's damn I'm sure they're very happy with Mac Jones. I'm happy with Mac Jones. Patriots, 6-4, and four, the sixth seed right now in the AFC. They got Atlanta coming up on Thursday night. Uh, everybody, be well, be good, be safe. He's Greg. I'm Nick. We'll catch you next time.